Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits, I have an update on my reverse engineered sweater, and I have my design planned for my 1970s vintage sweater. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen and use the chapter titles to guide you to the starting point of the desired section. Use the gear icon to slow down or speed up playback. So let's get started. In this first tidbit, uh, I'd like to share with you Andrea Animates, which is a woman who does animation using um, usually wool. It might be felted um, wool pieces or things like that. Many of the things that she animates are simple everyday things like opening a box of matches, lighting the match and letting it burn. But each thing is made from dry felted wool and there are great sound effects to go along with the animation. So here I'm going to show you on the screen a few screen captures from a video where she's drawing an apple with colored pencils and then after the final touches are made to the apple she reaches down and pulls a 3D apple off the paper. You hear the sound of the crunching and then she puts it back on the paper. I'll leave links to her Instagram and her website down in the show notes. She has films on her website grouped by category like a food or winter, things like that. Vivian Hooksbro has a new knitting book out called Vivian Hooksbro's Knitting Handbook eight schools of modular knitting. To give you a little background on Vivian, she is a Danish designer and she's written a number of books over the years, a couple of which I have in my knitting library. Uh, one is called a Shadow Knitting, which I have right here, which uses a concept that some people call illusion knitting. Uh, illusion knitting was really popular back in like the 2005, to 2010 um, time period. Many people used illusion knitting um, to knit in hidden messages and pictures. So what illusion knitting looks like is just that you have a plain garter stitch uh, striped piece of fabric. But when you view it from the side, you realize that there's actually more to what um, is in this knitted fabric than you thought. So Vivian's book on shadow knitting wasn't so much about hiding a picture as it was about playing with geometric patterns. Another one of her books is Traditional Danish Sweaters. This is a really wonderful book that gives the history of the type of sweater that truly is the first garment that we would describe as a sweater. And these date back to 17th or 18th century. Most of the garments that we think of today as a sweater or jumper in the UK were products of the second half of the 19th century or um, all the way into the, the mid 20th century. But the traditional Danish sweater was a part of women's daily dress through the day and night. You could only see parts of it while it was worn. Vivian visited a lot of folk museums to find surviving examples of these sweaters. And there's a large section in the front of the book on the history of those sweaters. And then it's filled with um, patterns. Uh, she's got a huge sti stitch dictionary um, within the book as well. Um, motifs that are commonly found in these types of traditional sweaters. And she's got a lot of information about the construction process as well. A lot of these stitch patterns are very geometric. So she seems to have a real affinity for geometric designs, whether it's in garter stitch or in a knit pearl pattern. Her new book uses her old friend garter stitch to create really interesting geometric fabric, but using techniques of modular knitting. So I want to go to the overhead and kind of take you through the book to explain what these eight schools of modular knitting are all about. So let's take a look inside the book and see what the eight schools are. School number one is stripes. And what you see here is that this is a piece of garter stitch that's only a few stitches wide and you knit a vertical strip. So then you pick a lot up along this edge and you can start knitting narrower stripes as you are knitting this way. 
Um, and then if you want to do another vertical stripe, then you can do so going up along the side there. So that's school number one. And then she has uh, two different projects for each school. One is typically something like a scarf or a shawl, and then the other is typically a garment. So she's got a triangular shawl here that uses this tech, those techniques, the very simple stripe techniques, and then combines them into something triangular and then into this uh, cool spiral stripe top. School number two is squares. And so it's using the basic concept of entrelac, which a lot of times we think of as being rectangular, but she's doing it uh, with squares. And so she shows the, the basic foundation for how to do that. And she's got uh, a vest and she's got a pillow. Again, two different projects, one more simple and one's a garment. School number three is what she calls tri-squares, squares with uh, triangles in them. And again, she's got explanations for how things are worked. So she's got a, what she calls a Viking coat here. And then she's also got um, this pillow thing. So you can see how she combines multiple colors within things to get really interesting effects. So school number four is right angles. So this square is knit in this direction. And then this dark square is or angle is knit in that direction. And then this one is knit in this direction. And then that's knit in that direction. And that's knit in this direction. So she's got a sweater that uses that concept and a pillow. Now this one is called staircases. You can see she's combining color in there as well. She gives the diagrams for how things are worked. So there's a shawl that uses these stair steps and then there's a jacket. School number six is called zigzag and it's this kind of an effect. So she's got a zigzag vest here and then she's got a zigzag poncho. So there's always something that's pretty simple without much, you know, pretty simple and then uh, something that is more of a garment. Um, but even the garments tend to have fairly simple shaping. Number seven is shells. So once again, she shows you the diagrams for how things are worked. And the projects for this, there's a shawl. And then there's the shell top that was on the front cover. And then this eighth school is circles. And for this one, she's got this kind of interesting uh, scarf. The scarf is looks like a snake. Um, and then she's also got a shawl. So the shawl uh, looks like this. So last summer I started a spinning project where I spun 30 different breeds of wool, one ounce of wool from each, um, so that I could kind of get myself back into spinning while also getting experience with a lot of different wool breeds. So I thought it would be interesting to turn the yarns from that spinning project into some sort of a reference textile with each square or shape of the, the textile made from a particular breed that I would, and I would have it labeled on the back so that I could look, go back and look at this textile and go, oh, that's what um, this uh, breed of wool was like, and this is what it looks like in its natural color. So the obvious type of project seemed to me to be some sort of a modular knit, but I knew that I would have to contend with the yarns not all being exactly of the same yarn weight. Most of them are pretty similar, but, but not all of them are. Um, so I was trying to figure out how I was going to deal with that in the context of knitting a modular sweater. Around the time I finished up the spinning and I was searching for ideas, I came across the Fruity Knitting interview with Vivian where she was talking about this book. It wasn't out yet, but I was really intrigued by the concept. So I pre-ordered it and then waited for it to come. I think it arrived sometime in June, but it wasn't until uh, today that I actually started looking through the book. So I really love the possibilities that she presents, particularly with how she uses color. But my yarn is all natural colors like this. And I wanted to preserve those natural colors in my reference textile that I was going to knit so that uh, I would know uh, that this particular yarn is a very white um, natural color while this one um, maybe was a little bit darker. Lately, I've also started doing some experimentation with dyeing, and that has given me an idea of what this reference textile could be. 
So I absolutely want to preserve the original natural color in each example, but I'd also like to see how each yarn takes dye. So there are a lot of different colors of natural cream as well as grays in my breed study. I need to think a bit more about what it is exactly that I want to do. But my current idea is to divide the yarns up by similar yarn weights. So that I might have end up with two or three different textiles. So I just so that the gauge for each of those particular textiles would be the same. So some of them might be thicker wools and some of them might be more medium wools. And then for each of the cream yarns and and the gray yarns, I will dye a portion and then keep a portion undyed. I do have a couple of yarns that are really dark brown, and so I won't bother dyeing those. I don't really see much point. Um, but that would give me the chance to dry different concentrations of dye or different techniques in dyeing using very small quantities. And it would also allow me to try some of the modular techniques in Vivian Hooks Bros book. So that's something um, that I'm going to be noodling about uh, for a little bit. All of her schools of modular knitting are really interesting, but knowing that I have limited quantities of each breed, I may do something fairly simple, like just the school number one with the stripes, just because I think that could be the easiest way to use as much of the yarn as possible uh, while remaining flexible if that amount of yarn is really limited. So potentially doing something like a vertical band of a wool breed in the natural and then doing perpendicular stripes, uh, alternating the natural with the dyed portion, that could be really interesting. But uh, let me know what you think about the eight schools and which one you find most interesting. And if you have a suggestion for how I could combine uh, dyeing my, uh, my hand spun breed project with Vivian's um, ideas for modular knitting. I'm in the very final stages of my reverse engineered sweater. It's really just the button band and weaving in a bunch of yarn tails and uh, lengthening the sleeves just a little bit as well. This is one of those things where it's so boring that I have to set a goal for a specific amount of length to knit before I let myself do something else. So uh, I've been marking like 10 inch increments along the way. I have just enough of the button band to go up one side here around the back of the neck and then down to the base of the V neck. So this is the point where the buttonholes will start. Uh, I need five buttonholes, but I hadn't settled yet on how I was going to do them. So I wanted to start here. When I was, uh, I wanted to stop here. When I was in the swatching stages early on, I realized that the architecture of the brioche kind of complicates the hand knit buttonhole process. The original sweater, which was a commercially knit sweater, uh, was made with machine sewn buttonholes. And those are placed in the ditch of the brioche pattern. So for a while now, I've been thinking about machine sewing the buttonholes because uh, it was something I'd wanted to try in a project at some point anyway. And I thought, well, this is as good a time as any to try that. So I did do some experimentation with machine sewing a buttonhole. And I realized that, that I was going to need to do quite a bit more experimentation, particularly because the, again, the architecture of the brioche stitch is so thick and cushy that I think it's complicating the machine sewn buttonhole, or maybe it's just that I'm so inexperienced with this. I'm not really sure what to do. I have a lot of different things that I would need to try to change like stitch length and stitch width and a whole bunch of other things and, and how to stabilize the buttonhole, not just with um, regular stabilizer on the back, but maybe with fray check and I don't know what all. Um, so it just seemed like it was a little tricky and even with practice, there's no guarantee that I'm not going to mess up when I 
try to put them in the real button band. And I don't have enough extra yarn to really risk mistakes. Because if I make a, a mistake in a machine sewn buttonhole, I have to cut that part of it out. I can't just rip it back. And I do still need to, to save whatever extra I have left over in order to uh, lengthen the sleeves. So I'm going back to swatching for a hand knit buttonhole uh, that I will find aesthetically acceptable. I had found several ways of doing them that I didn't particularly like, and I have come up with one that is functional, but I don't particularly like aesthetically. So I have th uh, two or three different ideas about how to improve the way that, that the buttonhole, the hand knit buttonhole looks. Um, and I also need to, to nail down the exact size I need for the buttonhole. In the meantime, I found some buttons that I really like. Since the beginning of this project, I have had an idea for the buttons that I thought would be really interesting. And I was able to find buttons in the exact right size and color that I wanted. And I was really happy to see my idea um, was going to work. And I actually uh, sewed them. I, I turned this band so you can't see it because <laughs> I want to uh, wait until uh, I've got this done for you guys to see it. But, uh, but these are the buttons that I have purchased. I mean, I've bought more than just three of each color. Uh, but uh, I wonder if you guys can guess what it is I'm going to do uh, with these buttons, how I'm going to use them. You can leave a comment below if you want to try to guess. So as I'm finishing up my reverse engineered sweater, I've been planning my next uh, vintage sweater project, which is part of my long-term project to knit a sweater from each decade from the 1890s uh, to the 1990s. And I really wanted to get this going because th for the first time since I learned to knit, I don't have anything else on the needles. So I, <laughs> I wanted to make sure that I could get started on the 1970s sweater uh, as soon as I was um, done with this reverse engineered. And there's actually um, probably going to be some overlap. My plan all along has to has been to design my own sweater using Elizabeth Zimmerman's so-called percentage system. Uh, and the idea behind the percentage system is that after you establish your key measurement, which is the sweater body circumference, you use a percentage of that key measurement to establish other circumferences like the wrist, the upper arm, um, the neck, so depending on the type of sweater it is, she will explain how to do the shaping between the underarm and the neck using some sort of shaping rate. For example, for raglan, she'll establish eight decreases in a decrease round, you know, at each, each of the decrease points, and then have you work the decreases every other round until you have a certain number of stitches remaining, which is probably a percentage of that key measurement and that will be the, the next stitches that you have left. But each type of sweater is approached differently in that space between the underarm and the neck because how a sweater is shaped between the underarm and the neck is what defines it as a type of sweater, how that shaping is done, how the sleeves come together with the body. So whether it's a drop sleeve sweater, a raglan, or satin sleeve, or some other type of sweater, um, the way things are shaped is going to be different. And now in last week's video comments, I got a note from uh, a woman named Jane who said, that she had knit several sweaters using Elizabeth Zimmerman's EPS system. She said, I have broad square shoulders. I did several raglans, a yoke sweater, and a saddle shoulder. I loved not needing patterns, but I wasn't successful in creating, creating exactly the fit that I wanted. I thought that I was too skimpy in allowing for ease, but there are a few folks for whom the EPS just doesn't work. She said she's five foot, or, or she was five foot eight and 110 pounds, so tall and thin to the extreme. I just wasn't average enough for EPS to work, she said. One of the reasons I was fairly sure that EPS, Elizabeth's percentage system, would work for me was because when it comes to sweaters, I just don't have fit issues. My challenge is with socks, which is one of the reasons I have so many sock videos on how to modify different heels and toes for a better fit. Sweaters, 
not an issue. Formulas are a really good starting point for understanding how to approach designing something. But no formula is going to work for every person every time because many of us do have fit issues. What's helpful is first discovering that the formulas even exist. Then the next step is understanding how they work and then understanding how to manipulate them so that they work for you and your fit issues. When I first learned to knit socks, I quickly learned that I have relatively skinny ankles compared to the average adult. So I need a sock that is smaller in circumference than the average adult. The thing is, when you knit a sock that is smaller in circumference, the formula for knitting the heel will cause the heel to be shorter in depth. But I have a relatively taller heel than the average adult, so I need a heel that's deeper than average. So having two fit issues that were proportionally skewed in opposite directions made knitting a sock that fit challenging for me. With some heels, I couldn't even get the sock on my foot. So some heel constructions are easier to modify for this situation than others. So for years, I stuck with one type of heel because it was easy to modify to get a good fit. But eventually, I figured out how to modify other heels in order to get a good fit. Uh, but it really did take time um, for me to get to that point and really understand uh, what the fit issue was and what to look at and how to uh, manipulate the formula. Sweaters are going to have similar issues. There are going to be some types of sweaters that you might find naturally fit you well while others don't. Some types of sweater constructions are going to be easier to modify than others depending on what it is that's causing the fit issue. It might be that proportionally you are different than what's expected but it could be an issue with something like your row gauge. I want to go to the overhead now and I want to walk you through the initial design stages of my 1970 sweater and talk a little bit about the percentage system as it applies to the sweater I will be knitting. So I'm using these two books to design my 1970s sweater. They were both published in the very early 70s. Uh, Knitting Without Tears by Elizabeth Zimmerman was published in 1971 and Barbara Walker's Second Treasury of Knitting Patterns was published in 1970. Each of them mentions the other woman in the acknowledgments or dedications of their books. So they were friends and correspondents and very supportive of each other's work. The sweater I'll be knitting is called uh, the Kangaroo Pouch Sweater and it is a circular sweater with set-in sleeves. So there's no knitting flat for any parts of it, no seaming in. It's entirely done in the round and it's done uh, by uh, using steaks at the underarms here. She is explaining all of this for as, as if it were going to be a stockinette sweater and using stockinette gauge. And I wanted to make sure that I used a gauge that uh, was exactly like stockinette, even though I didn't want to knit in stockinette um, because I find that incredibly boring. Uh, she really liked that. I do not. So I like having um, something really interesting, an interesting stitch pattern, but I didn't want to knit anything uh, stitch patterns that would change the stockinette gauge. So I knew I was going to need a knit pearl pattern. And so that's what I looked for in Barbara Walker's Treasuries. So I went to the chapter on knit pearl patterns and one of the very first ones that I saw was this one called the Imitation Aaron pattern. And it's this diamond pattern with what in the U.S. we call moss stitch. In the U.K. you'd call Irish moss or maybe even double moss. And then there are these zigzag patterns that also use moss stitch. So I looked at that and I thought, perfect. I love Aran sweaters, but cables do change dramatically, will change the gauge. So this would give me something interesting to knit that would not be plain stockinette, but it wouldn't change the stockinette gauge. So I had in mind having this go up the center, these flanking it, and the potentially there would there would be additional panels. Uh, I wasn't sure how far I could go because I haven't looked at the stitch counts at all. 
And then my plan would be at the sides to just have the moss stitch to use as in the same function that a filler stitch would be used in an actual Aran sweater. So to start with, let's draw a little bit of a schematic. So we have um, the body right here. And then at the underarm, we're going to lose some of that circumference and we're gonna come up here like this. So to start out with, you need to know what circumference you want your sweater to be. So for me, I have a 36 to 37 inch uh, bust and I, I want this sweater to have a little bit of ease, not a lot. Uh, so I want it to be a little bit bigger than my uh, bust measurement. I want it to be 38 inches in circumference, 38 inches. The way that Elizabeth's percentage system work is, works is by starting with this key measurement, like how big around you want your sweater to be. And then other parts of the sweater are calculated as a percentage of that amount. So for example, um, the top, the circumference of the top of the sleeve, right when it hits the underarm, uh, in this sweater, she is saying 33% of whatever this measurement is. And then the wrist down here, she's saying is 20%. Now you don't have to use that percentage. And, and those percentages may not work for you, depending on how your body is actually proportioned. It's going to work okay for me. I'm a very, I don't tend to have fit issues in sweaters. My fit issues are, are in socks. So I, I'm pretty confident that her percentage system is going to work for me. It may not work for a lot of other body types and certain types of sweaters may work better than others. You have to know how big around you want your sweater to be and then you have to know how wide your shoulders are so you know uh, how, how many stitches you're going to need to put on hold while you work this part between the underarm and the shoulders. So she, she suggests that the average adult has uh, uh, shoulders that are about 14 inches wide. I happen to know mine are a little wider. Mine are more like 14.5. Um, inches wide. So we know, I know I want the body to be 38 inches in circumference and I know that I want this actual width to be 14.5. So the front will need to be 14.5 and the back will have to be 14.5. So the way that this sweater works is that you go up to the armholes and then you put all of these stitches right here on hold. Um, you put enough stitches on hold to give you this amount of, of stitches remaining right here and then you work those in the round. You do cast on a couple of stitches uh, here and here to, to create a bridge between the front and the back and that's where you're going to be cutting your steek later on. So let's look at these starting numbers. So I have a gauge of five stitches per inch. That means for a 38 inch sweater to cast on in the round, I will need 190 stitches. So 95 uh, for the front and 95 for the back. So I, 95, I don't know if the stitch patterns I wanna use, I might want an even number instead. It just depends on how my stitch patterns are gonna lay out. So for now, I'm gonna say 95. We'll see once we look at my stitch patterns what I actually need. So 14.5 times five stitches per inch is 72.5. Well, obviously I can't, reserve 72 and a half stitches, it either has to be 72 or it has to be 73. But again, I'm going to need to look at my stitch patterns and do I need an odd number or an even number in order to keep things centered. So let's take a look at the stitch patterns that I've chosen. I like this as a starting point for the center panel. Um, then I have to look at the number of stitches that are used and then figure out uh, how I'm going to lay this out in the sweater. Well, this diamond pattern right here is a panel of 17 stitches. That's an odd number of stitches. Um, and the zigzag is seven stitches, but those are gonna be mirrored. There's gonna be one on each side. Um, so I don't have to worry about that because because that'll be 14 stitches every time I use a pair of these uh, zigzags. So I do have to have an odd number of stitches 
going up the front. So that tells me I will have 95 here and I'll have 73 here. Uh, so that means for the underarms, 22 stitches on each side. So 11 stitches here and 11 stitches here from the front and then 11 from each um, on each uh, side for the back. So in total, that's 22 stitches on hold on each side. And so I'll have 73 going up here. So now I know what my stitch counts are. And now I wanna think about laying these out and seeing how they're going to work um, in this particular, uh, not with this number of stitches in this layout. So this is just a tiny printout. I use Stitch Mastery. It's a way of charting out stitch patterns. And so when I'm laying out stitch patterns, in something and I know what my gauge is, I know how many rows I'm going to have all together, um, then I can kind of look at creating some vertical symmetry within the constraint of the number of rows I have. So I wanted to start with a diamond and end with a diamond all the way at the top and I'm going to be doing this square neck in addition. So I'm gonna have another little stick here. So I also wanted this to end here. She says, if you wanna do a neck, give yourself two to three inches. And so I found that an entire diamond was almost three inches or about three inches. And so, um, so I took that amount out there. Uh, and then the other thing I had to think about was the fact that the diamond has a 24 row repeat, but the zigzags have a 16 row repeat. So for every 48 rows, I have two diamonds, but I have three zigzags. So I wanted to make sure that the zigzags were going to end at, at uh, a place that was visually pleasing as well. Um, and so I kind of had to play a little bit with the zigzags and the repeats. So what I figured out was I could do a diamond here, uh, a set of zigzags here, and a set of diamonds here. Now I could have fit set of zigzags here, but what would have happened is that they would have gotten cut into at the underarm. So that's what's so great about filler stitches is that you can have enough that you can keep your central panel within the shoulders and then you can have the rest in filler stitch. I think it just looks nicer if you're not cutting into one of those stitch patterns because you can see that I am cutting into the zigzags here. I decided because these all have moss stitch, they're moss stitch designs, and, and I mean the US moss stitch, which is knit one, purl one across, but knit two, purl two up. In the UK, they call that Irish moss or sometimes double moss. Uh, so I wanted to use that here at the side for the filler stitches. And I in particular did want uh, this to come up here because the way that the sleeve works is that you pick up stitches you, th that you've had on hold, you put those on the needle and then you pick up stitches all the way up to the shoulder here and all the way down. So you have all of these stitches on the needle and then she wants you to work for an inch um, before you start doing uh, the set in sleeve shaping and decreases. So my idea was that that one inch would be moss stitch. So I'll have moss stitch going in, um, perpendicular from this moss stitch, but just the way that that design works, it'll be really hard to tell uh, where that transition is. Last week I had um, swatched out the way that this armhole is shaped. And so when you, if you work a uh, an inch of stockinette and you're working everything else in stockinette, you can kind of see that line of decreases there. And it's not that it's completely unsightly. I just thought, oh, if I have seed stitch um, from the edge up to here, that you probably won't be able to see that at all. So I did a swatch of the stitch patterns to make sure I liked them. Uh, so that was you know straight across. And then I worked across uh, in moss stitch right here and I wanted to see um, what the shaping looked like for the sleeve when I actually did it and if, if the moss stitch helped to hide uh, the shaping design. I was right, you cannot see um, the shaping at all. It just disappears into the seed stitch. Zimmerman's formulas are typically based on using stockinette. That's the easiest way to learn any sort of percentage system or formula for knitting without a pattern. You don't have to worry about stitch or row repeats. You can widen or lengthen as necessary. 
and you don't have to worry about transitioning from one stitch pattern to another in any sort of elegant way. Uh, if you're interested in learning to knit without a pattern but want to start with something smaller than a sweater, I do have a couple of Technique Tuesday videos that could help with that. One is how to knit a hat without a pattern and the other is how to knit fingerless mitts without a pattern. I will leave links to those down in the show notes. So I am really excited to get started on my 1970s sweater. I'm sure I will have some progress updates for you next week. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.